We're going to look at, he said, what? Sorry, my voice is gone. He said, what? <laughs> Pretend like my voice isn't gone. It'd be awesome, okay? Are there any high, high school girls? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. Uh, we're going to look at four confusing things that Jesus said. Uh, there they are right there. Number one, you are gods. Number two, she's a dog. Number three, whatever the two of you want. And number four, I'm not really that good. These are four things that Jesus said that are extremely confusing. Um, I know a lot of people who, when they get to parts that Jesus said in the Bible, they just like to skip over them because they're kind of confusing. And uh, sometimes we have this idea of mixed up ideas about Jesus. And so we read something that's hard to understand. So we just pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> but we're not going to do that. We are going to look at these look at these four things. Today, we're going to look at the you are God's bit. Um, I've heard a lot of uh, televangelists, a lot of very common uh, Christian teachers talking about this. And uh, I believe with my full heart that they have a complete misunderstanding. So I think it's very necessary that we look at it. This is from John chapter 10, which John is probably the least understood of the, of the Gospels commonly. Most people, you know, they can understand Mark. Luke is, you know, okay, all right, Matthew, okay, a little bit confusing in there, but okay, all right. But then you get to John, and they're just like, I have no idea what's going on. Um, a lot of people have a hard time with it. And uh, as a result, <laughs> a lot of uh, false teachers use John as a crutch to teach all kinds of strange, crazy things. So uh, in John chapter 10, uh, Jesus is having this discussion with these, with these Jews. They, they come up to him and they say, look, stop with all the cloak and dagger. Can't you just tell us? Are you the one or are you not the one? I mean, just just say it, say it plain. And so he answers by giving them a bunch of these vague answers and kind of parables and all these things that are hard to understand, <laughs> which I think is funny. I think Jesus had a little bit of humor to him uh, because here they are saying, hey, can you just tell it to me straight? And he's like, let me tell you a parable. Uh, and so this is what he says in 34 through 36 here. Jesus answered them, isn't it written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called those to whom the word of God came, gods, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say you are blaspheming to the one the Father sent, uh, set apart and sent into the world because I said I am the Son of God? Now, see, this is a little bit of a trick question because that's not exactly the issue that they had with what Jesus said. But he redirected the conversation and he, direct, and he showed them a verse that they didn't fully understand. And used it as, a, as an opportunity to try and teach them. Um, unfortunately, though, we read the rest of the story. They did not listen. So this, this verse that he's actually talking about, that Jesus is talking about, is quoted from the Old Testament. It's a, uh, it's a psalm, one of the psalms. It's Psalm 82. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. Just a few parts that are relevant to what we're talking about in John. Uh, the first two verses and then verses like 6 through 9, I think. Um, but you're more than welcome to read it through yourself. Uh, God stands in the divine assembly. He pronounces judgment among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? I said, you are gods. You are. This is uh, 6 through 8. I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. However, you will die like humans and, uh, and fall like any other ruler. Rise up, God. Judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. So, wow, what's going on here? Well, Psalm 82 is actually a... Um, let me let me come, let me come back to that. First, I want to point out what uh, I heard Joyce Meyer saying um, in one of her um, one of her sermons. Um, she made the comment, and she brought up John ten thirty four, and she said that we are all little gods. And her point was that we're not God with a capital G, but little gods with a with a little G, and that um, we need to wake up to who we are. Uh, we need to realize who we are, and then walk in that. And uh, then we will come to, I don't know, a better, uh, we'll somehow be able to glorify Jesus more by walking in our own strength, realizing that we're little gods. It's, it's kind of a confusing thing. Um, it's, it's like she was trying to have a pep talk, and I'm not quite sure where she was going with that. But uh, the problem with her idea of Psalm 82 is that nowhere in the original text does it actually say little gods. It says very plainly, you are gods. So the question then being, is God telling us that we are gods? This is a very interesting thing because you don't really hear people talking about this. You hear the false teachers talking about it, but then, you know, the ones who actually know what the Bible says, they just kind of skim over it and they say, well, we're just not going to talk about that psalm. That's the psalm we don't talk about. 
Um, another another one that people don't like talking about is uh, Psalm 137. You read it probably a week or two ago if you're still uh, reading through the Bible with us, where it says, how blessed is the one who dashes their little ones against the rocks? And you're like, oh my gosh, what are we talking about here? Once again, remembering context is very important. But uh, so let's let's stick with this. In Psalm 82, the psalmist is actually talking about the judges. If you read through, you can see it very clearly. He's talking about the judges of the land and how they weren't judging correctly. And then he goes on, and I think it's verse 3, to tell them how to judge correctly. You can read it through for yourself. And then he comes back and talks about the way that God is going to be the judge of the judges, which is kind of a, a funny little little thing there. Um, there's a lot of things that are going on in Psalm 82 in the Hebrew, and I'm going to try and bring out the things that are most important. Um, the first thing uh, is if you had if you had been born and raised in ancient Near East, this would have made a lot more sense to you. Uh, the Canaanites had this belief that there was a council of gods. So not, not one god, a whole bunch of gods. And there's a council of gods. And the one who's at the top of that council is El. And uh, so then, you know, you could kind of pick and choose what's right and wrong by which gods you would worship. And so there really was no correct right and wrong. It's just kind of whatever floats your boat. And uh, which we kind of see that a lot nowadays too. Um, and so what happened is he's condemning the false gods while claiming that he alone is God, but that's not all he's doing. Another thing that he's doing is he's condemning uh, the false judges. Now, let me, or I should say not false judges, they were really judges, the, the bad judges. They weren't good at their job. So now let me kind of break down some words for you. Um, the word that, that, that is translated gods is, it's Elohim. Um, you might have heard it, El, Elohim. Uh, people think that this is a name for our God. It is not a name for our God. It is a general word meaning God. Um, nowadays, we use God a little bit different. Like when we go to prayer, we don't say, dear Yahweh, right? We say, God, dear God, or dear Lord, or, uh, you know, stuff like that. But um, that's not actually God's name. Uh, when you see a lot of the times in the Bible, it'll say, uh, if you read the NASB, for instance, it'll say LORD, all in caps, um, kind of smaller than the other ones. Uh, that's Yahweh, the Lord God. That, that would be Yahweh. That, that is his actual name, the only name that he's actually given us. Some people go off on all these different names of God, like Adonai and all these different things. Those are human-given names. The only name that God actually gave himself was Yahweh. And uh, so then L is kind of like a stand-in. It's a general word meaning meaning God or gods if it's in the plural. So um, if you look at uh, the BDB, which is kind of like the leading um, leading study book for uh, Hebrew words, um, it it will give something along the lines of this. And these this is a direct quotation. I'm just kind of trying to shorten it here. Um, rulers or judge. A divine representative, a superhuman. Um, also, it can include. Where did I? I lost my note here. It can include God and the angels. So that's kind of a wide range of meaning for that one word Elohim. If you notice, um, another thing I want to kind of point out is that one word can have a variety of meanings. Take, for instance, our word ruler, right? Am I talking about a ruler that a nun would smack your hands with? Or am I talking about a ruler as in, you know, the person who's ruling something? That's the same word. It's spelled the same way, but it has a wide variety of meanings. And what makes it even more difficult is that ancient languages, they didn't work the same way as modern ones do. You know, they, they had a lot of, well, if you study, if you study history, like, there'll be a little mark that stands for something, and then they, they adapted like kind of a, a whole you know alphabet and stuff, and then words developed. And as that happened, one word could really stand in for a lot of different things. And they didn't think about the world in the same terms as we do. For instance, um, Genesis talks about how the flood covers the whole world. Well, that's not a very accurate translation. People didn't think in global terms back then. It should be translated... He, the flood covered the whole land, the whole face of the earth. Everything that could be seen was covered in water. You have to understand it for how they meant it back then. So, you know, El is a general word, meaning God. It's not God's name, but if you study the uh, the Hebrew, the Hebrew um, 
language, you'll, you'll find that L is kind of stuck in in a lot of words. Elijah, Micah, L, Michael, L is at the end, stands for God. Um, Israel, if you ever want to know how to spell most Hebrew words, the E is usually before the L, so they can, you know, slip L in there. Um, there, there is a, a lot of back and forth as to whether El is actually a Canaanite god. Part of the part of the discussion is centered on the idea that some people don't think Israel came from Egypt. They think that Israel was always there. They were one of the Canaanite people, and therefore El would have been nothing more than he wasn't special. He wasn't unique. He was just one of the other Canaanite gods. Israel worshipped him more than the other ones, but he was just another god. So it, it kind a lot of the discussion kind of centers on that, and you really have to watch out when you're reading history books, because some historians come to it with kind of a closed mind already. So this is where we get to another idea. Judges and rulers in the ancient world were believed to be appointed by God. If, you, if there was a judge, it was believed that that judge was appointed by God himself. So therefore, the judge was expect, expected to be a reflection of God. Well, so that would mean that if a judge judged dishonestly, that's dishonoring God because he's supposed to be reflecting God's character, but instead he's ridiculing God's character by not judging correctly. Let's say, for instance, letting a rich person win when they were the one in the wrong so that he could take a bribe because the poor person couldn't give a bribe. That would be blaspheming God as a judge. And if you read um, the biblical law, which it didn't give options, you know, this is what this God demands, this is what the, it said, this is what God expects. <laughs> And uh, if you read in, in the law, it actually goes to great lengths to talk about, you know, being um, not giving false witness in court and that kind of stuff. This is a lot of the stuff of what it was talking about. So now we get to Psalm 82, and this is just beyond funny to me, I think, because remember, it's the same word God as, as judge, okay? God stands in the divine assembly. He pronounces judgment among the gods or the judges. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? You can just kind of hear the sarcasm. Like, here, you, you guys are calling yourself judges, and it's all actually a play on words, too. You're calling yourself gods, too. And then he gets to verse 6, eight, and six through 8, and it says this. You are gods or judges, either or. It really means the same thing here. You are all sons of the Most High. However, you will die like humans and fall like any other ruler. I'm going to judge you. You have exalted yourself above because you are a judge. And yeah, sure, you are a judge, and I'm going to judge you. Because you didn't judge correctly. You were a poor reflection of my character. That would be a, another way you could say this. So although they were acting in the place of God as his representatives, they saw themselves very arrogantly. And they would be judged for how they acted. Now this is obviously, as you can tell, I have no idea what I did. Ben, did I do that? That was you? Oh, thank God. I... I love it. I love it when dad does this. But when I do it, I'm like, man, I'm supposed to be like more hip to the jive. All right. Did we get it? Awesome. Cool. Um, well, that's something to keep you from fall falling asleep there. So uh, in, in Psalm 82, this is not, he's not literally saying that they are gods. We know this because the Bible says, Throughout the whole Bible, there is no other God but me. None will be created after me. None was created before me. There is no other God. I alone am God. He says it like 15 different times. So we know that God is not literally saying that these judges are, are gods. It's a play on words because the same word translates judge as God. They were acting like gods, and as judges, it was their place to act in the place of God, but they were doing it um, poorly. So now we get back to John chapter 10, right? And Jesus is having an argument with these, with these Jews, and he quotes this passage because it's not understood then any more than it's understood now. So, you know, and you could also, you know, have, a, have an argument about whether it should be translated as God or as judge. But Jesus throws them on their hills by translating it as God. I said you are gods. And are you saying that the Bible can be set aside? Because if you look at what he says here uh, back in... I think it's like 35 here. If he called those to whom the word of God came, and 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 you know the scripture can't be broken. It's like he's he, he's purposely trying to trying to cause them to think. And uh, 
So Jesus was having an argument with, the, argument with these people. They weren't getting it. They wanted him to come out and say it, but then they also wanted to kill him for saying it. So it was a little bit confusing. And uh, they were upset at him for a couple different things. And one of the things he says is, what, what thing, what, what good thing did I do that you're, that you're stoning me for? Are you, are you stoning me because I was healing people? Or what's, and they say, we're not killing you for any of those things. We're killing you because you, you, claim, you claim to be this. And then they are the same ones who said, come out and tell us. What are you really? So here's, here's a, little, a little trick thing. So you want me to say I am God so that you can kill me for saying that I am God, right? That's kind of what, that's what you're wanting me to do here, right? So instead of being, being straight with them and, and just, you know, coming out and saying it, he gets them involved in this conversation that, that really um, tries to get them to think and to process the information, but they just won't budge. They're just hell-bent on trying to get Jesus to say that he is God so that they can kill him. It's like, guys, are you listening to what Jesus is trying to teach you? He's trying to teach you something here. Very important. Very important. So, you know, as far as, as far as, so is Jesus really God? Well, Mark is considered to be the oldest New Testament book. It was the first one written, most people think. There is a little bit of disagreement. It might have been the, the book of James. But mostly scholars believe it was Mark. And so this is what Mark writes. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. This is John the Baptist. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Well, if you go back into, into, into the book of Isaiah, what word translates into Lord? Is it El? No, it's Yahweh, the actual name of God. So what Mark is saying here, and what Isaiah is also saying is that Jesus Christ is the same Yahweh who spoke to Moses and said, I am that I am. Mark isn't mincing words, and neither is Isaiah. They're both saying, Jesus isn't a lesser God. He's not a created God. He's not kind of God, but not the same as the Father. He's saying, Jesus is Yahweh. It's a clear affirmation. And remember, this is the oldest part of the New Testament. This isn't something that was written hundreds of years later. Jesus came in the 30s. Mark was finished by the 50s, probably written in the 40s. So we're talking about a span of not even 20 years, and you're telling me that the manuscript was corrupted that quickly? I don't think so. I really don't. Anyways, and then uh, if you look, go back and going back to John 10, which is actually where we're at. I know you might not remember that we're in John 10 because I've taken you to Mark and I've taken you to Psalms and I've taken you to Isaiah. We've been all over the place. And it's not even 12 o'clock in the morning. How great is that? Uh, and John, after, after he says the thing about, um, about them being little gods, he says in, in, in verse 30, I and the Father are one. And this is another thing that they're not really liking because there's a lot of ways to translate that, but the way that Jesus meant it is very clear. We are the, we're the same. I am God. God the Father is God. And it's very clear that that's how he meant it. But the Jews, they want him to say clearer, I myself am Yahweh, so that they can kill him. They're just waiting because you couldn't put somebody to death just for anything. It had to be blasphemy. Well, there were other things too, but I mean, it had to be a clear affirmation, I am God, for them to be able to kill him. So in order to keep their own law, <laughs> they can't kill him unless he comes out for it. So they say, hey, can you just say it more clear? And so Jesus gives them a bunch of confusing, vague answers uh, to try and get them to think. You know, some people, and me, for instance, I would just walked away and said, ha ha, neener, neener, you'll never get me. But Jesus takes the opportunity to try and teach them something. So then we get, if you hop a couple of verses down even further from this in 35 to 36, if he called those to whom the word of God came, God, I'm, yeah, I, I said that wrong earlier. This was after. When he said, I and the Father are one, that was before the passage I meant. That was a misspeak on my part. Um, if he called those to whom the word of God came, God's, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say you are blaspheming? So let, let's, let's look at this, okay? The bad judges in Psalm 82 who were not doing their job, they were, they, were, they were abusing justice, and God is a God of justice, and they were abusing justice. Those bad judges were sarcastically, sar sarcastically called gods by God. So then how is it wrong if God can call them gods, even sarcastically, 
how is it wrong for Jesus to say, I am the Son of God, when God was the one who set him apart and sent him into the world? How is that wrong? The implication here isn't just that Jesus is God. He's also saying more. Anyone, it, it, it was common believed uh, belief in Judaism that anyone who did the work of God was a son of God. He was a son of the Most High. So Jesus is hanging them up on something so that they uh, have to face the fact that he is God without him saying, I am God. <laughs> So Jesus was intentionally vague. He didn't, he didn't say, uh, the Jews didn't necessarily say son of God. He redirected them so that they would think, but their pride blinded them to Jesus and what he was actually saying. So then we get later here to verses 37 to 38. If I am not doing my father's work, don't believe me. If I'm not doing God's work, don't believe me. But if I am doing them and you don't believe me, then believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I in, in the Father. So here we have yet another thing. Jesus was validated by two things. Number one, what he did, and number two, what he said. He said, if you're not going to believe what I'm saying, because it was very clear what Jesus was implying. The Jews knew what he was trying to imply, so they were trying to trap him. Remember that. So then he brings out a, a scripture, because they love scripture. They were all about scripture. They, they hated people, but they love scripture. So he pulled out scripture, to try and to, to try and get them to, to think, and it still wasn't enough for these people. Um, but Jesus was validated not just by what he did, but also by what he said. The Father and Jesus were individual, but the same God, so they shared common purpose. Jesus submitting to the Father wasn't as big of a deal as us submitting to somebody because they already had the same purpose and goal. See what I mean? It's not like they were, Jesus was all like, I don't really want to save people, God. And God's like, yeah, I know. But go ahead, because I want you to. It wasn't like that. The Bible is clear that there's only one God. It is absolutely clear about this. I mean, it, it goes to great lengths. If those of you who are reading through the Bible uh, this year, you'll, you'll see how many times, and obviously I could have spent a lot more time, but I don't want to um, just keep beating a dead horse. Uh, sorry, Ann. <laughs> um, that's a joke. Uh, you know, but the Bible is absolutely clear that there is only one God, and we are not it. We are incapable of being perfect. He, Jesus, is incapable of being imperfect. Jesus can't sin. He couldn't sin while he was on earth. He can't sin now. He is incapable of doing something wrong. He is incapable of sinning. Jesus is incapable of sinning even when he was a human. We are incapable <laughs> of being perfect. Complete difference there. So all these people who say we are little gods, what would you call that? You would call that a you would call that a false teaching. Just because the Jews didn't understand what Jesus was trying to say doesn't mean we also have to not understand what Jesus was trying to say. So when you look at the threefold witness, right? The Bible, church tradition, and Jesus Himself, all three of those never once taught that we were little gods. Or ever would become God, even when the Holy Spirit is given. There's this belief that goes out that's saying if we get the Holy Spirit, we can do the same as Jesus. That basically, by us receiving the Holy Spirit, we can become elevated to the place of God. That we can, because of the works that we do, will be greater than Jesus. And somehow, in our greatness, it'll point back to, to Jesus. But that's not what the Bible, church tradition, or Jesus himself ever said. So if those three witnesses, the Bible, church tradition, and Jesus, did not believe that we are little gods, why on earth would that verse have been in the Bible? Obviously, it would not have made it into the Bible if the Bible itself, the church, and Jesus all taught that we are not little gods. If, the, if that verse taught that we are little gods, it wouldn't have made it into the Bible because they would have taken it out. So by the very fact that Jesus quoted it, we can know, and the Bible has it in there, and the church kept it in there throughout the years, we can know that we are not little gods. So, you know, to kind of wrap, wrap things up here, we don't need to awake to who we really are and walk in the power of ourselves. 
we need to surrender to God and trust him to lead us forward. We don't need to find the inner strength in it. We need to lean wholeheartedly on God. And that's one of the biggest problems with a lot of these um, Christian authors and, and Christian speakers and Christian uh, you know, uh, televangelists and all these different things like, like Joyce Meyer. Is they, they tell you a lot of things about how to be better people. Christianity is not about being better. It's about trusting and depending on God. They don't tell you depend on God. They say, hey, you got the power in you. You just have to walk in it. That's a lie. That's not true. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what Jesus said. We need to surrender to God and trust him to lead us forward. We cannot bring ourselves or anyone else in the whole world to God if we think we are God. And I'll tell you why. Number one, it'll be all about us. Look at me. Number two, sin will become not a big thing. Sin, eh, it doesn't really matter. Number three, hell will, will become not really real. It's a metaphor. Uh, number four, the gospel will be no more than social work. So long as you're doing good for somebody, that's all that really matters. So in order to, to really come through with this, Christians have to adopt, let me say this differently, Christians with a self-righteous and arrogant attitude will always turn people off toward God, but Christians who humbly realize who Jesus is and who they aren't can truly love. Realize who Jesus is and who you aren't. He is the answer. You aren't. He's unlimited. You're very limited. With him, nothing's impossible. With you, almost everything is impossible. We face situations in work that we can't resolve. Situations, I mean, you go down the list. So let's look at John 12, 32. It says, as for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Jesus is talking about his death and resurrection and ascension. This, this already happened hundreds and thousands of years ago at the end of the Gospels. However, this does still apply today to the church. If we as a church exalt Jesus, people will be drawn to him. If we exalt ourselves, our propaganda, what we want done, it'll push people away from Jesus. So then I've heard it said by a lot of these claiming to be Christians, and they say something along the lines of this, walking in my power does glorify God. It brings glory to God when I, when I walk in the realization of who I am. And that sounds good, but here's the problem. What you're saying there is you're saying, don't depend on God. That's what you're really saying. If it's all about if I walk in my inner power, well, if I walk in my inner power, then what do I need God for? If being a Christian is nothing more than trying to be better, trying to be a good person, then what do I need Jesus for? I can go outside and help an old person cross the street all by myself. I can do that without Jesus' help. I can be a good person by myself. See, I mean, it's not about Jesus. It's not about trusting in him. Because Jesus said that only God is good. That means it's not about being a better person. It's about trusting God. So be careful, be very, very, very careful what and, and who you listen to. We are trying to bring people to Jesus. We're not trying to awaken them to the power within themselves. You see people do this with prayer too. I declare it and so it is. I'm going to go to prayer and I'm just going to, I'm just going to, well, because I said it so and that's, that's how it's going to happen. Where's the dependence on God? You know what a prayer is? Is it a request of God? God, I am dependent on you. You don't have to do anything, not even if I declare it to you. You still don't have to do it. I am asking you. I'm appealing to you in your mercy. Please, please, God. That is a prayer, and that is dependence on God. When we go to God with our dependence, he'll listen because that's a humble heart. When we go in there barging in the place, listen here, Jesus, this is how you're going to handle this. Well, guess who's not going to listen to our prayer? God actually said, I will not listen to the proud. I will, I will turn away from them. I got other stuff to do, but the humble I will not ignore. Now, th those are kind of big words from God himself, the creator of the universe. I think that we might want to listen to it. Lord, thank you so much for where you brought us today and for what you're doing in us, God. Lord, I just pray you continue to work in us. Help us to not buy into the lies of some of these, some of these public speakers and writers, Lord, that, that we wouldn't learn to depend on ourselves. God, that we learn more and more every day to depend on you. God, that we turn to you for our strength and for our healing. 
And Lord, we, love, we love you so much, Lord. Help us to be a reflection of you. Help us not to be like those evil judges in Psalm 82 who showed favoritism and who abused people. Lord, thank you for being who you are to us. We love you, God. Amen.